When the original 5e setting Broncolonia came out in 2020 after a successful Kickstarter, I wasn't really paying much attention. Then it won four any awards, including gold for best electronic book, silver for product of the year and best writing, as well as a silver for best setting. And to be honest with you, I still didn't pick it up because it was keyed to 5e. But when I finally got around to reading the four books that now compose the wild Italian fantasy setting of Broncolonia, I think the only word that I can use to describe my reaction is bedazzled. It just became almost immediately apparent to me that the ideas and the originality and the artwork of the setting went way, way beyond most RPG settings, 5e or otherwise. The publisher Acheron, who also created the Inferno setting as well as the Biblical Apocalypse setting that I've covered on this channel, tend to use the open license D&D 5e rule set as the backdrop for their books, but they really transcend anything and everything that Wizards of the Coast themselves have ever published. With the case of Broncolonia, they've accomplished this by having a clear vision for what their fantasy world is supposed to be, and a clear passion for the media and literature that inspires that world. That media and literature happens to be decades and centuries of classical Italian tradition, folklore, history, landscapes, literature, and pop culture. At the time of this recording, Broncolonia is comprised of four books. There is the setting book, which establishes the replacement classes for the 12 standard 5e classes, as well as introduces some important rules changes, setting information, and monsters. Then there's the Macaronicon, which includes a bunch of extra races and subclasses, details about the world, and about a dozen mini adventures. Then, based on a second Kickstarter that they ran, there is the Empire, Stru Empire Wax Back, which contains a few more races, some new items and spells and details about the setting, and most importantly, a whole campaign accompanied by 10 new monsters and a slew of NPCs. And finally, Jinx's Almanac, which is a lot like the Macaronicon, a motley collection of plot hooks, setting details, and mini adventures that were released piecemeal during or after a Kickstarter campaign, but which are now collected and organized into a tidy volume. At the time of this video's release, there is a third Broncolonia Kickstarter running that is going to add three more books to the setting. A bestiary with over 100 monsters, some of them getting four to six pages of description each, as well as a bunch of recipes detailing how to cook some of these monsters to enjoy in-game. A gazetteer, which will act as a traveler's guide to the so-called Bounty Kingdom, the fantasy Italy in which the setting is rooted. Just like with everything else in the setting, there will be real-world locations and concepts twisted and transformed into the strange and fantastical style of Broncolonia. So you'll get the Leaning Tower of Pisa and the Colosseum, but recast in some dark tongue-in-cheek way. The third book, Furious Lands, will be a bunch of small adventures and one longer campaign based on an official living campaign that was played out in 2022. In this video, I'm going to cover the first four books and just try to show you what I mean when I say that this setting bedazzled me. And look, this is not a perfect product. As always, I will share my honest thoughts about the pros and cons of this setting. I'm not sure if this map is included with every purchase of a Broncolonia book, but the back of this one mentions the Kickstarter that I talked about a minute ago. There's a free quick start for you to grab as well. The setting book runs about 200 pages, and I'm pretty sure it's stitch bound. As with all the books in the series, there is a stunning map in the front end papers, and the pages have that aged sepia background. The pages themselves are primo quality, and the print colors and text are as crisp as you can ask for. The end paper artwork in the back is also quite nice. The Macaronicon is 166 pages and starts with the same map at the front. Again, you're going to get a hefty premium looking and feeling book. This book has a number of adventures with some really nice encounter maps as well as city maps. The back has a different end paper art piece that is also quite beautiful. The Empire Wax Back campaign book runs 253 or so pages and features a different map at the front, the Free Cities of the North where all the adventures of the book take place. As I mentioned before, this book has a lot of setting material besides the main campaign, and we'll hit some of the highlights of all this material later in the video. One thing you'll notice here, if you haven't yet, is just the sheer attractiveness and readability of each of these pages. I think they did a great job of avoiding any massive text walls on any given page, and of course, the artwork is excelente. Bit of a spoiler here, but check out this five-story siege engine that you take on. There are a lot of maps like this that I won't really show in the video because I don't want to spoil these encounters for any potential players watching, but they're really nicely illustrated and described. The end paper here, it has quite the tableau, pretty much the most 
Broncolonia-esque scene you can imagine. The last of the four books is Jinx's Almanac. I didn't mention it before, but all of these books have a nice thick matte finish for their covers, and the cover art is pretty great on each of them. Jinx's Almanac runs about 171 pages and is a bit less focused than the others, being a repository for various ideas and concepts gathered from different sources. It really fits the description of an almanac, and they designed the interior to feel like something from the 16th century. And just for good measure, they include this incredible illustration in the back, because, you know, Acheron. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, by the way. Okay, so the setting book for Broncolonia pretty much establishes the world we're talking about in this video. This is the best top level description right here, based on Italian tradition, folklore, history, landscapes, literature, and pop culture. And here's another great summary, a back to front version of medieval Italy. This fantastic fairy tale influence, roguish world, quotes, collects, and mixes contributions from contemporary and classic Italian fiction, pop culture, and collective imagery. The list of inspirations for this setting is probably the best explanation of why this setting is so impressive in its depth and peculiar but singular identity. I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen or read almost any of this stuff and it would probably take me a solid year to explore thoroughly. But once you start reading Broncolonia, they've already digested all of this for you and regurgitated a magical recombination of all this media that spans hundreds of years. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So what exactly does the setting want you to do or be as a character? Well, very clearly, you're a lazy swindler, a lowlife scoundrel, listless dabbler or greedy knave. Officially, all playable characters in the setting are knaves, and they are members of a company of mercenaries, rogues, or other questionables engaged in jobs of dubious repute. Your group is called the band, and you typically do jobs on a hired basis. The game master is the condottiero, which is probably the most perfectly fitting Italian word for game master here. Although, just to be clear, the GM fills a pretty standard role at the table. They don't actually just play as the mercenary leader NPC. It just happens to be a cool word that fits the role of GM thematically. As far as races, there are some that are really emphasized by the setting itself, while others don't really show up that much again in the books. You have humans, which represent 90% of the population, gifted, which are actually humans who have one natural magical ability or another. The source of their power can range from some old wives tale being true to having some magical heritage or anything you want. Morgants are giants who haven't been seen in the kingdom for 500 years but have started showing up again. They range from 7 to 9 feet tall, so they're not super huge or anything. Then you have the Sylvan, who have thick body hair but are almost entirely human otherwise. The difference between them and a quote-unquote human is their culture, as they live as hunter-gatherers in untouched nature rather than in cities. And then you have the marionettes. This is by far the most featured fantasy race in the setting, and also the most fascinating and original. They are puppets constructed of magical wood that goes by many different names, like trifle wood or turquoise wood. The creature is normally childlike in size, and by default looks like a medieval wooden doll but can talk and walk around on its own. They are commonly employed as entertainers, actors, and musicians, which has made them accepted in the kingdom as just another race in society. If your first thought was Pinocchio, you're right on track. A Pinocchio is actually one of the sub-races listed for a marionette. If Malabranch sounds familiar, it's because you might have heard the term in the Inferno video that I made, a 5e setting made by the same company that made this setting. Malabranch are almost human-looking demons who have escaped hell and live now among the people. They're often foul-mouthed and vulgar and have no respect for local customs. There are only several hundred across the land, which is an important detail if you want to play one. The classes in this setting are technically subclasses, each branded with a thematic name. Barbarians are pagans who live along the border of the kingdom. You'll notice that they, like all the classes, have features that only reach level 6. I'll get to that in a minute. Bards are harlequins who typically belong to thespian troops that either perform at some theater or maybe travel the lands and entertain. Clerics are miraculists. Bards are benendantes, or good walkers, forest sorcerers who straddle the boundary between the spiritual, human, and wild realms. They are generally committed to defending the rhythms of nature and the seasons. Fighters are sword fighters, which, by the way, I think the most notable thing here is the portrait for this one. Sometimes it's easy to take artwork for granted, but really, what a remarkable illustration this is. It really encapsulates the brand of Italian fantasy that Broncolonia is trying to be. Anyway, you have your friar, who is your monk stand-in. Monks get a fair amount of attention in the setting, with different orders being described and mentioned throughout the books. 
The most prominent of them are members of the Brawley Orders, who are really predisposed to fighting and fighting criminals. Their motto is Ora et Tombura, or Turn the Other Palm. A paladin is a knight errant, who are described as rambling knights who are the beggars aristocracy, and often demand to be treated as such. They are sellswords and vagabonds for the most part. A ranger in the setting is a matador, who are expert hunters and can capture beasts and take them to cities to be sold for combat or fight them themselves in arenas. Rogues are brigands who take on the role of bandit robber and street thug. The kingdom is full of brigand companies and many of their members claim to be the kings or queens of all brigands in the land. Sorcerers are called superstitions who act as enchantresses and charmers, experts in hexes and sorceries, arcane arts and fey powers, typical sorcerer stuff. The warlocks is a jinx and all of their powers are derived from Madam Jinx, a sort of god in the setting referred to as a misfortune. Jinxes tend to conjure and cast curses. A wizard is a guiscada, which essentially just means magician. They are all part of a closed and exclusive guild of con men and magic users who are hell-bent on recovering artifacts, relics, and totems of magical power and knowledge. They want these things in order to empower their college, and by extension, themselves. The list of languages in the setting here give you a good topology of the society it's presenting. First you have the common language, which is simply called the vernacular. Then you have Draconian, which hasn't been widely spoken in a thousand years because the Draconian Empire is long gone. Then there is Macaronic, an official language spoken in the halls of the current empire's religious and bureaucratic apparatus. You can sort of think of vernacular as modern Italian, and both Draconian and Macaronic as two forms of Latin, if you want to analogize these. Below that is Badam, a more fantastical language that's really only comparable to D&D's Infernal. Then Lingua Inota, the language of angels and celestials. Then prehistoric writing called Petroglyphic. And finally, the true vernacular of the land called racket, spoken by street actors, carnies, and other travelers. I really want to point out some very important things that Broncolonia brings to the table in terms of rules. And this was something I wish I had known when I first wrote off this setting for using 5e rules. The creators actually managed to make a few changes to the 5e rules that make this a much more interesting game. The first of these rule changes is the level cap. Instead of a character that can reach level 20 and attain demigod status, your character can only advance to level 6. After that, advancement comes in the form of the so-called emeritances after every 9,000 XP after the first 14,000 XP. Some of these are limited to certain classes and others you can take twice. These will definitely continue to power up your character, but at a much slower rate than the standard rules. And that's all in order to give the game a more gritty and grounded feel. The second really important rules tweak is referred to as Knave's Rest. And it is simply that a short rest takes eight hours and a long rest actually takes seven days. Which is to say, recovering from conditions and getting your hit points and spell slots back is way more difficult. Which means you can't approach combat as lightly or as frequently as you would with the vanilla rules. The third important innovation here is this whole sequence of rollicking or downtime activities. This feeds into a couple of other subsystems where players spend their loot and free time building up a den or hideout that can take virtually any form, as well as manage their character's personal misdeeds, bounty, and notoriety ratings. I'm not going to go into too much detail on those, but it's clear that these additional rules really lean into the life of a band of knaves. It is worth mentioning the ways that you can level up your den. The upgrades are called Grand Luxuries, and they each come with levels of their own. The first level costs 100 gold, and the second and third levels are 50 gold each. For longer term play, it's essential that everyone at the table remember to utilize these in order to enhance their character's survival rate. There are rules for non-lethal fights called brawls, and this is a good way to engage in tavern fights without risking everyone's characters. Brawls don't have to take place in a tavern either. Actually, having the option of explicitly non-lethal battles opens up all kinds of narratives and play possibilities. The idea is that you can have a combat encounter that doesn't slow down a main narrative. A brawl won't maim or kill anyone, so it can give you the satisfaction of a fun scene without disrupting and derailing overall plot progress. Check out the depth of the Brawl minigame here. There are dozens of colorful moves to choose from, essentially making it more fun than actual 5e combat. And speaking of minigames, there are dive games. 
Poppycock is a card game but is simulated using dice so you don't actually have to play an hour of cards. Barrel Beating, Broncolonian Buffet, and Poor Man's Carousel are also functional games that you can essentially play at the table through your character. I want to point out a couple of pieces of magical junk that your character can acquire because they're so emblematic of the setting's strange, sometimes slapstick humor. Often slapstick humor. A moody weapon will change into a completely different random weapon every time you roll a one on an attack, and a waffle shield will break into a shower of edible cookies if it takes a critical hit. And on that note, here you go. A breakdown of just what kind of setting this is. I almost think this page should be at the very beginning of the book since it sums up everything so well. This paragraph here was particularly illuminating to me. When in doubt on how to describe a scene, Imagine that you're on the set of a spaghetti fantasy movie. The American equivalent would be a cheap sword and sorcery movie from the 1980s. Ragged extras, recycled character actors, natural backdrops or miserable villages, cheap magic. This is the look and feel of the game they're going for. There are dozens of pages describing the kingdom and the surrounding lands. If the peninsula looks like a warped, lumpy, melted version of Italy, that's pretty much because it's exactly the point of the setting. Every detail in the setting feels like it came from actual history and was cooked in weird oil and changed into an irreverent fantasy version of itself. There's a lot of slapstick humor, but also a lot of darkness and death as well. In Search of Quatrains is a collection of seven small adventures that can each be run in about one session. Not surprisingly, you get some great NPCs and really nice encounter maps in each one and towards the end of the book you get 12 fantastical monsters to pit players against, all lavishly illustrated and described. This section of the book is a good portent for what the full bestiary book will look like. When these guys want to describe a monster in depth, they go all out, maybe even to a fault. I think as a GM it would take me quite a while to fully internalize this stat block. But obviously not all monsters are going to have three pages of stats. Here's a giant dragon-like thing called a bigot that has a tidy stat block. Macaronicon is the second of the four books that I wanted to show you in this video. It's the first official module published for Broncolonia and collects every stretch goal that was reached during the setting book's crowdfunding campaign. So naturally it's going to be a bit of a hodgepodge of content, but you can see here that it's well organized and sorted. As far as the new races, I think it's important to note that they mention two more kinds of marionettes, those living dolls made of magical wood. The cabin doll is a sort of sailor boy construct and the saintlet is a religious figure created with magical trifle wood. Quote, these marionettes are generally more haughty and inspired than the impetuous and rowdy Pinocchios built in Torrigiana, and often manifest innate powers of divine origin. Just imagine that for a moment. In this setting, you can play as a little living wooden marionette named Jesu Cristo, who goes around casting divine magic. If you find that sort of thing funny, then Broncolonia is for you. The class of puppeteer is a natural extension of the marionettes in the setting, and you get a lot of lore-infused context for them. By the way, this might be my favorite illustration in all four of the books. There are two kinds of puppeteers you can play, either a mangiafuoco or fire eater, who is not emotionally tied to their creations, or a Geppetto, who does have a paternal or maternal connection to their creation. Both types have exclusive mechanical benefits. Additional subclasses include a Mountaineer for the Barbarian, a Guapo for the Bard, who are popular singers, storytellers, and auctioneers, often settling disputes and smoothing out wrongs and quarrels thanks to their charisma and common sense. Clerics have the Exorcist, who belong to one religious congregation or another, but mingle with knaves when conducting secret missions. Fighters have the Bravo, who are sword fighters that dwell in cities. I can just hear the petty admonishment coming out of this guy's mouth. Non parlare più male della mia scarpe. Monks have the Svanzic Guard, who are thought of as the aristocracy of the brawly orders of monks, and experts with the halberd. The Paladin's Gallant Knight is an interesting one. They derive their divine powers through love, and that is typically a declaration of love for another person. There is a specific person called a paramour who you have to declare your love for, and your character must serve them, either through righteous or maybe misguided chivalrous duty. Rangers have the rat catcher. By the way, I skipped over it, but one of the new races in this book is a cat person. The authors did what they had to do so that you can play as puss in boots. Rogues have the gadgeteer. Notice this one's arms and legs. I think this is the first illustration of a marionette in the books. There are some more items and magical junk included. I was wondering about this one here, the broken compass. I couldn't help but wonder if this was an easter egg or homage to the game Broken Compass which I reviewed on this channel and which was made by fellow Italian game publisher Two Little Mice. 
I know that they and Acheron have collaborated before, so this might have been a little hidden joke. As I mentioned before, marionettes get a lot of attention in this setting, or rather, the wood that comprises them is very well described. This section explains how the magical wood that makes them also makes several other kinds of entities, such as mandrakes, which are naturally occurring humanoids that form spontaneously in turquoise wood forests. Mannequins are human-sized wood constructs made by fairies. Jubianas are created when a trifle wood tree falls over and the trunk grows arms and legs and starts walking around. They take the form of a very large, cruel witch. And marots, which encompass everything else you can make from magical wood. Little animals, automatons, even talking furniture or a talking stick. I think the authors leaned in on this magical wood because it creates such a fertile ground for fun storytelling. If you have a material in your setting that can make a wooden chair sentient, you really have to grab that with both hands. This section here describes the different in-world cultural traditions in masks and puppets, and it was pretty stunning. Everything in this world seems to have meaning and history to it, which is a feature born from the fact that it's based so closely on a real history and culture that runs deep. You don't have to use these details in your game, but if you do, it's just an incredible way to create immersion. There's a whole mini game that simulates a fantasy version of soccer here, with Italy having a national team that has won the World Cup four times, one of the most successful in the history of soccer. It's natural that this would find its way into the setting. Even though this book is broken up into little micro sections that only run two to four pages at a time, you really have to read this stuff if you want to pick up some vitally important information about the setting. For example, extravaganza is the name given to the magic that permeates the land. But there's also this extra dimensional plane called the Great Extravaganza where absolutely anything goes. Anyway, here's a giant golem made of polenta. If you're not familiar, polenta is a sort of porridge made of cornmeal, historically made from other grains as well. It includes salt, butter, and cheese. This polental alimental will suck you into its body unless you can make a DC 14 strength saving throw. I think it's due to the extravaganza everywhere, but things in this setting tend to clump up into walking monstrosities. Here you have the relic cluster, which is like the polenta monster but with dead bodies and relics. There are about half a dozen fantasy recipes in here as well. These are functional recipes, but also have fantasy ingredients. This is a pretty elaborate way to get a magical effect for your character, but I do appreciate the Italianness of just throwing in some recipes here. Actually, food is very much a theme in this setting, so this works. This section called In Search of Quatrains again actually has 11 mini adventures, each running 5 to 10 pages. I'm not going to show them in this video as to avoid spoilers, but it's worth noting that they do contain some very nice encounter maps and colorful NPCs. The Empire Wax Back is essentially a campaign but also contains some smaller adventures and independent setting information. By the way, the title of this book is what you think it is. The references to Star Wars are hot and heavy in this book, and I sort of have mixed feelings about it. I'll show you what I mean. So first, there's a description of this period of time in the so-called Bounty Empire, a time of war. Then you get some new races, including the Arachimboldo, which is a clumpy conglomeration of stuff. They can be a collection of different kinds of items, like a mass of fruits and vegetables, a mass of clothes, or a mass of scrap metal and tools. Another race that comes up a lot in this setting is the Jack Rabbit, which are these vicious little rabbit folk that tend towards violence. A Paragool is more or less your character, just undead. What's funny is that there is very little in the way of drawbacks. You age five times more slowly, you're immune to diseases, and can even pretend to be dead during a fight in order to trick your enemies. There's no mention of smelling bad or anything. You do lose one point of intelligence, but gain two points in any other stat. I think the most interesting thing about this race, if you want to call it that, is the fact that it's a hilarious backdoor for any mortal PC that gets killed. In that vein, you could eventually end up with an entire party of Paragools. I've been kind of skipping over all the personalities and backgrounds listed in the books, but I have to stop here and show you this one because it's important. The Order of the Fork is essentially the Order of the Sith, a secretive, evil, and very ancient group that can use powers akin to the Force in Star Wars. Choosing to play as a Fork character unlocks all kinds of Sith Jedi-like powers, although it's important to distinguish between a Fork Adept, who is still ostensibly working for the Order, and a Fork Renegade, who has turned their back on the evil Order. And here you have the Fork powers, Force Choke, Force Decept, Force Dexterity, and Force Push, all of which are perfectly cool. But this is what I was talking about earlier with the Star Wars parody stuff. I like it personally, but the fork pun might just be a little too cheesy for me personally. 
I know they were going for something lighthearted and maybe food related since it's Italy and Brancolonia and all that, but it's just a tad cringy. Nevertheless, fork users, if you please, can get pretty badass. Check out this post level six power up right here, bolstered by the fork. All critical hits scored against you are considered normal hits, unless you're incapacitated. And then of course there's force lightning, so you can channel your inner Imperatore Palpatine. You get a lot more magical junk in this one. I'm not actually calling it magical junk, that's what they call it in the game. There's this whole ecosystem of junky equipment and counterfeit goods that your knaves are constantly getting a hold of, and the magical items are pretty questionable and unreliable most of the time. Actually, this stuff wouldn't be so bad if your character were to get a hold of it, but beware the clever GM who might slip you a counterfeit version that blows up in your face at the worst possible moment. Here's a glance at some new spells. Notice the fact that they almost all have to do with deception. This is because you're a relatively low level knave in this game. There are descriptions of an imperial taxation service, plague delivery service, and here you have several orders of monks, all of whom are extremely odd. One bit of actual civilization is the capital city of the opposing Altamanic Empire, Aquis Grama. It's a little pocket of renaissance, whereas most of the bounty empire where you hail from still has one or both feet in the dark ages. The several pages of name generators are indispensable if you're at a loss as to how to keep up with the distinctly Italian slapstick humor that is on offer here. And here is the 10 part campaign itself, the empire wax back. A princess, Lelia, has gone missing, and it has triggered a whole kingdom's worth of bounty hunters, mercenaries, companies of fortune, and bands of knaves to find her. For the reward money, of course. But you get swept up in war, and a number of Star Wars jokes threatens to kill everyone at your table. I'm not going to spoil the campaign for you here, but suffice it to say, episode one of the campaign is called Stall Wars, and it has to do with, you know, market stalls like these. There are some more monsters at the end that are a lot of fun, like the Bonacon that sprays acidic feces. And remember how I said all the extravaganza floating around makes things clump up together into humanoid shapes? Well, here's a crawl slaw for you. Oh, and here's another one. It's made of guts, tripe, brains, sweet treats, innards, and other animal parts presumably collected in the waste bin of a castle kitchen somewhere. And here are some generic city guard NPCs called Culveraneers. This is definitely one of my favorite illustrations. Dart Mallet, a Malabranch or Demon NPC? You can probably imagine what he looks like. Ingrid the Hut is bloodied out here. I'm not sure I get the joke or what's going on here, but a hut's a hut. You can probably homebrew this character if you've ever watched any Star Wars in your life. And if you've watched The Mandalorian, you can also probably come up with a character concept for Moff Gedeone. But here's Lord Valter, a boss level NPC who is more metal parts than man at this point. Saw Barrera may sound familiar to you. In this case, he's a marionette and a she actually. Soratana here, a dangerous fork renegade who wears long braids with blue ribbons. It actually goes on and on, but you get the point. This whole book is just relentlessly faithful to the joke that it has committed to, such that by the end of it, you can't help but doff your hat at the whole thing. Jinx's Almanac is the fourth and final book I'm looking at in this video, but I'm only going to show you a few pages. I figured by now you've gotten a very firm idea of what Broncolonia is all about. This book is another hodgepodge collection of setting, details, and ideas, as well as a fun collection of eight mini adventures at the end. Since this book is styled as an actual almanac for the most part, you get a lot of information presented in medieval almanac format, which is a lot of fun. I didn't quite find as many crucial bits of setting information in this book, but if you've read this far into the setting, you're not in it for defining information as much as for fun details. The secondary cultural information goes so deep with the setting at this point that I'm not sure what table of GM and players could really incorporate all of this. For example, here is horoscope information for different months of the calendar year. There are some very dangerous bounties to maybe throw at your players, including Lucrezia of Almaviva, who will likely turn all of your players into paragools. And a little bit of redundant information and artwork from previous books, such as Ahsoka, uh, Soratana here. But I forgot to point out in the previous book that these Order of the Fort characters even carry around lightsaber stand-ins called light clubs, which light up and everything. Salty Sailor's Misfit Tales is actually a collection of four short adventures, each presented in a loose order, 
and some of which are loosely connected to events in the Empire Wax Back campaign. Good Knaves Wanted is another collection, this one comprised of three short adventures that more or less connect with each other. And finally, there are the more standardized eight short adventures at the end of the book, each keyed to different starting levels. I mentioned it at the top of the video, but the Kickstarter that just launched at the time this video came out will include a bestiary with over 100 new monsters, some of which will be four to six pages in description, as well as cooking instructions for a lot of them. The recipes will actually yield special effects for your characters, so there is some incentive to cook them up. Then there's the Gazetteer, an atlas of the world of Broncolonia. Basically in this world, you don't know much of anything outside the boundaries of this fantasy Italy. There's the nation of Frange and whispers of a Briton that goes by another name, but you're mostly just focused on the peninsula. And finally, there's the Furious Lands campaign and adventure book, which will present another full campaign. You'll want to click on the link to the Kickstarter to get more information on these books. So, all right, I've kept you long enough. Here are my thoughts on the first four Broncolonia books. Death by puns. Also, I wish I knew more Italian. I largely enjoyed the wordplay and playful interplay between English and Italian in these books. But like I mentioned with some of the Star Wars stuff, some of the puns take a bad bounce. Such is the danger of being humorous, they can't all be winners. 5e e for reach. I have two things to say about this setting being 5e. E. One is that I understand why they would use 5e e rules. It's not my personal preferred rule set, but it has the most reach in terms of market, and more reach means more people will adapt and play and enjoy all the hard work they put into this. The other thing I'll say is that I'm impressed with the rules tweaks that they made so that this game is actually much more brutal and gritty than the 5e default rules. And the brawl and den and bounty mechanics really reinforce the theme of this setting in concrete and playable ways. Requires lots of reading and buy-in to fully experience. This is a lot of books to read. It's a lot of information. To get players to truly and fully enjoy the setting, they really actually have to read some of the stuff. And that's a tall order for a lot of folks. Can be partially adapted. So all that being said, two of these upcoming books, The Bestiary and The Gazetteer, can be used without needing any of the other books. I thought that feature was pretty clever since it increases the approachability of the setting and hopefully gets it to more tables. Utterly bedazzling depth. There's that word again. The sheer breadth of the pseudo-culture and history of the kingdom is staggering. Everything from the style of puppet you're seeing on the street to the month your character was born in has a meaning and a history deep catalog. When the dust settles on this next Kickstarter, there will be seven books detailing this world. Most RPGs do not get that far. This is a complete world at this point. Excellent print and presentation quality. It almost goes without saying that the layout, writing, artwork, and overall cohesiveness of concept are second to none in these books. This is just par for the course with Acheron, but I always have to remind myself that this is not the norm. This is way, way above average in terms of quality. Unfortunately, not all RPG settings can be this thorough and born from passion that leads to deep research and adoption of so many resources. You would think that the current license holder for Dungeons & Dragons with millions of dollars in operating budget per year could produce something a fraction as good as Broncolonia, but as it turns out, you cannot buy passion. That's all I've got for now. I've left a link to the latest Kickstarter for Broncolonia, which is offering an exclusive miniature in the first 72 hours. Let me know in the comments what your experience has been with this setting. I'd love to hear about them. This was a long one, but thanks for watching all the way to the end. See ya.